to talk about the Meats Tech team, but before we do that, um, I'm just going to take it upon myself to get us all to stand up and just uh, stretch a little bit. And as we do that, I'm going to read this little one verse from Isaiah 9-2 and have you participate through part of it. And I'm sure you know this scripture. Um, it's on our prayer stone, and I'm, I'm sure you've been there. <laughs> But if you haven't, actually, we invite you to go to the All Nations um, up there on the hill and go and walk through there and pray for these people groups that are represented on these stones. But Isaiah 9-2 says this, The people who walked in darkness have seen a, can you help me? Great light. They have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them his light shone. So you can sit down. Thanks for your little exercise. Um, but yeah, maybe thinking about the great light can take away the tiredness a little bit. And um, <clears throat> I apologize, I'm struggling with a little upper respiratory thing. Maybe like Levi, I should just go home and wear my mask, like he said last night. But <clears throat> well, we're here to talk about the Meeks Tech team and are excited to um, represent them here. We're just, uh, my family is just one of the families of three that are there. And um, so there's a little map you can see here. And down in the very bottom, the little pin didn't stick out as much as I wanted it to, but there's a little red dot down there at, close to the bottom. And that's where the Meeks Tech are from. The Meeks Tech are a pretty big group um, scattered across several states of Mexico. But yeah, thank you for that little little thing. So that, that area where we're at is just a, s a small part of the Mistec people. So there are many, many uh, dialects of the Mistecs. These people were once a, a mighty ruler in Mexico, and they once ruled a large uh, section of Mexico, kind of from the central part of, of Mexico, where it starts to kind of get dry and high up there, and then down into Guatemala, they had a big kingdom. Um, they co-ruled at one point with the Aztecs, but that was over 500 years ago. And the Spanish came in oh, just, just right about 500 years ago and took over Mexico, and, and the rest is history. And these people no longer have that power. Um, but yeah, just a little brief update. I know there's been some history shared about our, our team, but yeah, back in 2015, the Wagner family went down and started learning language and culture. And um, they moved into a little village of, these, uh, of this particular language group, and there are no believers in that, in that, lang in that language, or I'm sorry, in that village. <clears throat> and so they've, they're still there in that village, living there, and in, in 2020, it was right at the end of 2019, um, our family, the Flory family, and then the Hagees, Leonard Hagee's family, went down there too at the same time. So we began learning uh, Spanish and Mexican culture. And um, more recently, both of our families have began learning the, um, the Mixtec language and culture. So that's a big undertaking for us, and that's where we're at right now is still learning that. So... Lots to learn, yeah. So, <clears throat> I think what I'm going to do right now, we're going to show a video that uh, our team prepared for a prayer event back in January. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Destinations International and their prayer event called Unite, but we felt really privileged to be part of that, and they asked us to put together a little video. So, we did that, and it's still relevant enough. So we're going to show that. It'll be about six minutes, and then I'll wrap up. So. Hello, my name is Ethan Wagner, and my wife, Lene, and I, and our four children have been living in the Mistec region for about the last eight years. We live in a remote village, some seven and a half miles from here as the crow flies, but it can take as many as two hours to get there in the rainy season. So it's a very remote village. Uh, the people there are subsistence farmers. The men spend their days mostly in the field. 
growing things like corn and squash and pumpkins and coffee. The ladies spend their days at home uh, keeping the house. There's no currently no gathered church there, no gathered group of believers, and no Bible. So we spent the first five years of our life there just focused on Mistech learning. And now, these last several years, we've been working at Bible translation with our co-translator, Alejandro. We've been able to develop a series of Bible stories from Genesis through to the ascension of Christ. And my wife has had the opportunity to, to teach these lessons to a couple different ladies and lead them to Christ. But overall, I would say there's been a lot of resistance toward the gospel. Mies texts are largely resistant to anything different than the Mies Tech way. They're animist, and they're very fearful of change. They're also a communal society, and so there's a lot of social pressure on them to keep things as they are. And I would just ask that you would pray with us, especially over this next year, that God would, as he's already opened a couple hearts, that he would continue to open hearts. He would confirm his uh, will for us and being there in the village and that the gospel would continue to go forward, that God would raise up a group of uh, believers there that could form themselves into a healthy indigenous church. May God bless you. Hi, I'm Jordan. I represent my wife, Jana, and our five young children. You know, we moved down here to the coast of southern Mexico almost four years ago and started studying the Spanish language and the Mexican culture. And just last year, we made the transition into the indigenous community of the Mixtecs. And so now we're studying their language and their culture. I believe there's a lot of spiritual interest among the Mixtec people. Yet I know that there's many barriers to the gospel actually taking a root in the heart and um, really changing their family and their life. And so these are things we pray for, that God would break those barriers. Um, as we study language and culture, we're looking for those kind of things and we're trying to understand how to approach these, these subjects. The, the Mistech community feature is really powerful. Um, it keeps everybody together. They kind of all know what's going on. There's a lot of gossip, of course. But they are, they're kind of like one body. They want to operate as one body. And when somebody doesn't want to cooperate well, it can, it can get ugly. Envy is a problem among the meat sex. And, and this has uh, very destructive and powerful features to it, to the point that well, you don't even want to grow some crops because you might, you might think that someone's going to go and pinch the buds off of your, off your fruit tree or off of your, your vegetables. I see many opportunities for development. Something that we get asked about a lot is English teaching. Another opportunity that I see is literacy. Um, almost no one reads Mistech, and there's almost no books written in Mistech, although there is an alphabet. The thing about the Mistechs that keeps me up at night is that they don't know Jesus as their savior. Their community gives a death to them. I want the Mistechs to know Christ, and I want them to be gathered into the community of believers. My name is Leonard, and my family and I have lived in southern Mexico for about four years. Three of those years we have spent living among and interacting with the Mixtec people of this region. The village where we live is one of the larger mixed tech communities in this area, and there is a small but active Christian church in this village, as well as small groups of believers which meet in some of the surrounding villages. Now the dominant religion of the mixed tech people is animism, but this has been influenced by Catholicism over the past centuries. However, the animistic shamans remain influential individuals in their communities and are some of the most active in resisting Christianity. Some Mixtec villages are openly hostile to the gospel being preached in those villages, even going so far as to drive out or imprison those who attempt this. And this sentiment, this hostility to Christianity, 
is driven by those who do not want to lose the traditional customs and belief systems of the Mixtec people. The Mixtec people do not have the Bible in their language, and of course this handicaps the spiritual growth of the believers who can only access God's Word in the Spanish language. A few of the Mixtec believers can read and understand Spanish well enough to rely on the Spanish Bible for their spiritual instruction but the majority read Spanish poorly or not at all. So the Mixtec Church sorely needs the Bible in their heart language, as well as being taught how to read it. And these needs are something which our team, with God's help, is working to meet. Yeah, that kind of gives you a, a, a good overview of what's going on there. And when you hear Ethan talk, you hear him talk about his village where there's no gathered church. And you hear uh, Leonard talk about the village where him and I are at, and there is a small gathered church there. We're thankful for that. Um, some of that was discovered in the last uh, year and a half or two. And so we're really excited about that, and yet also aware that there are a lot of dangers in a little growing church that's brand new. Um, <clears throat> so even just this last year, I'll just mention this is, is just for your, um, yeah, so you can pray for this, but a, a cult came from the from the Philippines and uh, took away some of the believers of that that little church. So it's a really painful time for the, the little church there. Um, but there's there's a little picture of that church that of this church that sticks in my mind, and I probably will never forget it. And it's of in one of the little villages that are next to ours. There's a tiny church, and I was able to go and visit there. And I didn't know about their old pastor, but their pastor is probably about this tall, um, very, very old, and can hardly see. I mean, I don't think he could see me until I was really close to him. And his Bible was huge, big old Spanish Bible in old language Spanish. So he doesn't really understand that very well. But he was standing there in this dark little adobe house, getting ready to preach his sermon. And he had his huge flashlight looking down at his huge Bible with its huge magnified words and he had a magnifying glass and he was going to read one verse and that was going to be it and he was going to rely on memory from there and um, yeah just his heart to preach the word and that's all he has just a little bit he can read and he understands so we pray that it will keep growing like that um, like Leonard mentioned there's been some hostility. And just recently, several of the believers there from our village went to another village for uh, evangelism. They were in prison for several days. Uh, just the local police people put them in their little, little building and keep them there. So, but in Ethan's village, it's been a different story. And I'm just going to give a brief overview of that. Um, back in 2022, they were really, they were, they were really uh, preparing and getting ready to teach uh, chronological Bible stories there. And that's kind of from creation all the way leading up to through the prophecies to Christ. And they were so excited. And they had it all lined up. And they went to every house in the village and asked permission. Can we, can we do this? And, yeah, we want you to. And we'll be there. And they, were, they thought maybe we should just get the whole auditorium there in town, like the, like the basketball court, to start the teaching. But they decided to start small, just do it in their home. And maybe about 10 people came to the first teaching night, and then the next night maybe there's only three, and the next night really nobody came. And that was it. And they were just not sure what was happening. Um, just processed that and prayed, and um, we prayed with them. We didn't know what, what was going on either. They talked to some people, and they said, well, it, it's an awfully steep hill here where he lives. So can't, it's, it's hard to make it up there. You know, just coming up with reasons. Um, one lady said, it's, it's, it's quite a ways. And, you know, these people walk a long ways to their fields and carry big bags all the way back to the village. And that's nothing to get to Ethan's house. But obviously something had disrupted that. And, and it came out that there was a girl there, about a 20-year-old girl, that had a dream. And it was a dream of people, there were bad people teaching the children. And they interpreted that, that this is what's going on here. It was after the first night of the teaching, this dream came to her. And that spread like wildfire through the village. And that shut her down. 
There was no more teaching after that. And so Ethan and Lene were obviously very, um, very devastated. They just weren't sure where to go with this. And after preparing for you know, eight years for this and years of preparation, um, it felt like maybe God had just pulled the plug on them. And so really struggled with that. Um, they ended up coming back to the States and processing and getting some counseling and um, spent several months here in the States just waiting on the Lord to renew them. And when they found courage again, they went back to Mexico. And they laid out a fleece for this year. Just said, well, Lord, we're just going to lay it out here. And this next year, we're going to go back to our village. And we feel called there, but if nothing happens in the next year significant and we don't think we should stay any longer, we just will look for something else. But we're relying on you. And so um, it was about one month ago, Ethan was just faithfully doing his work. And um, he was going to his co-translator's house to work on translation work. And he heard footsteps behind him, literally on a little footpath going through the woods around houses, which they all weave through like people's yards and stuff. And footsteps come up behind him, and it's, uh, it's about a 20-year-old girl. She's like, hey, hey, um, uncle, when, when are you going to start your, uh, your teaching again? And he's like, well, well what, what teaching? And this is kind of awkward because, you know, men and women that aren't married, they don't hang out together. And, and she's kind of non-traditional. And it's the same girl that had the dream, uh, you know, that shut this thing down. And he's like kind of realizes it's her and not sure where this is going. And, you know, Ethan, he's just faithful plugger. And he's just walking along. He says, well, what do you mean? Well, that teaching about God. Um, well, would you like to learn about that? Yeah, we want to. My father-in-law and my husband, we want to learn. And he said, well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll come see you tomorrow night. <laughs> he wanted to give time to go home and talk to his wife about this. And they prayed, and, and we heard about it from them too. And so they went, and they visited, and sure enough, they do. They wanted to learn. So <clears throat> they started teaching them, and they've been teaching now for over a month. And they're just not even sure... You know, he said, should I even be excited, brother? I said, yeah, you should be excited. But, you know, after such disappointment, it's hard to know uh, where to go with your feelings. And so do pray for them. And as, as you, as you um, whoever comes up to pray, just remember them in that. So I wanted to share that. It's very exciting. Um, it, they have a, a long road to go in their teaching and in the Bible translation. But God has really, uh, kind of when we give up, he kind of steps in. So that's... Um, now, I have another, another slide. I just want to end with this little scripture out of Galatians that tells us to be not weary in well-doing. For in due season, due, due season we shall reap if we faint not. This is a truck of, of coffee beans going out of our village. And when we left on our trip to come up here, we left our village for the last time, and, and that was a truck we came across on the road there just whining up an old hill. And <clears throat> I thought, huh, that's a good picture of the harvest. That just represents everything that we're hoping for someday, everything that the Lord is hoping for someday from this world. And... I want to tell you, and it's just you know, from our team to, to, to you all here, but let us be not weary in well-doing. Keep sowing seeds. We're going to reap a harvest. Uh, they're among the Mestecs, but in these teams that are out, out there um, from the desert to the tropics, uh, we are going to reap a harvest, and it is going to be a big truckload coming up to God someday. Um, so I'm excited about that, and I just can't hardly wait, although we, we know there's a lot of work between now and then. But um, so maybe this can spur you on as well. So that's all I have to share. just want to say to you that it's a real blessing to be here with you and to feel your support. You're here for many different reasons, um, interest in other teams and um, such. But 
Yeah, when we encounter hard times, we often think about people that care about us, and we see faces like yours in our lives.